become a little complicated. Let's just do it this. And if I do this way, it would this, inside. This is your clip here. It should uh, it would inside. So who was that anyway? नमश्रीयतिराजाय विवेकानंद सूरय सचित सुखस्वरूपाय स्वामीने तापहारिने I bow down to Swami Vivekananda, the divinity manifested, who came to this earth to remove afflictions of the people of the humanity and who was the king among the monastics. This was the expression of a brother monk to Swami Vivekananda. When Swamiji passed away and brother monks were very sad, one of the brother monks, perhaps Swami Turiyanandji said, so far we were thinking that Swami Vivekananda is one among us, our one of the brother disciples. We all learned, sat at the feet of Sri Ramakrishna, learned from him, were trained by him, were inspired, touched by him. We thought he's one of us, but it was not that. It was like the moon that is reflected in the water pool and fish moving around the shadow reflection of the moon think that, oh, this round shining object is one of us. And when morning comes and moon sets, they feel sad and ask their seniors, where that being gone? Where our friend gone? And the seniors say, whom you thought to be one of you, was not really of you. It is the moon that lives high up in the sky. Just you thought that it is one among you. That was Swami Vivekananda. And who says this? His brother disciples who lived with him, who practiced meditation with him, who were trained by Sri Ramakrishna with him, and they understand the greatness, the huge difference between this brother monk and themselves. And the rest, 11 of the brother monks, at this 16, 15 brother monks, they are also exalted beings, exalted yogis. Then what was Swami Vivekananda? Swami Vivekananda was the yogi born and what were others? They were yogi made by the divine touch of Sri Ramakrishna. I'm so glad to be here today and grateful to revere Swami Chidanandaji Maharaj that he invited me. And when I came to Canada, I had to rush to serve Swami Pramathanandaji Maharaj. Many of you know him. He was quite sick. There was no time to wait for immigration, formal immigration. I came as a visitor. And he passed away within three weeks of my arrival there. I spoke with him only one day. After that, his voice was gone because of advancement of cancer, pancreatic cancer he had. But he talked with gestures and he wrote beautiful handwritings when he was sick. Till his last breath, he had the full control of his life. Whatever he said, all they accepted. That was wonderful strength of this sannyasin had. And for the five years, I had to undergo the process of immigration. It took so long time. 
I was not allowed to go out of Canada. And I was waiting to see U.S., the place where Swami Vivekananda was known to all of, world over. And this, after I got immigration in five years, just five years ago, and I had to wait another five years to get the call from Riviera Mora, then to come here <laughs> to the city which made this great yogi known to the whole world. It just manifests whatever people don't know. It is the great city that gives a president to this country, to this Chicago, and this Vivekananda Vedanta Society of Chicago, so close to the city itself, and it is in the city, we believe, greater, if, if after some time we'll call it Greater Chicago, perhaps Homer Glenn, a part of Greater Chicago. I feel so, so happy to come here. Before that was the retreat arranged, and such a wonderfully organized Ganges retreat, the houses, the buildings, everything was just imperfect. I came at 1.40 at night, 1.40 a.m. And the arrangement was such that one devotee at 1.40 a.m. press says, Swami, you are welcome. This is your room. They were all ready to welcome at 1.40. I had asked how to go, how to sneak in the room, not to disturb any others. And, but they feel joy to be disturbed at 1.40 at night and find the joy in welcoming the visiting guests. Wonderful time meeting devotees and that serene place in the Ganges itself. It was like taking a dip in Holy Ganga, being in the Ganges monastery. I had heard about this center. That is a big center, huge work going on, and a lot of effort going on. But I couldn't believe it would be so beautiful. The house, the sprawling area, the property, everything arranged so nicely. And if the dream of Swami Chidananda inspired by Thakur Mahan Swamiji. You know, these things, these great works cannot be done by the, without the inspiration of divine. When they give inspiration, the strength comes and the impetus comes in one person. And then it is told to others and it catches the fire. Help comes, the God's help comes through many persons, many devotees, many persons come together with their might, with their physical, um, intellectual, financial, all help comes together and you find the Homer Glenn Center of the Vedanta, Vivekananda Vedanta Society of Chicago. I'm so fortunate to be here and to meet you all and to be honored to be the first speaker in the series of talking about Swami Vivekananda. Talking about Swami Vivekananda to you who are in Chicago and who attend the talks here by the learned Swamis, even my brother monk, Swami Ishatmananda, my bathmate. I was with him for two years in training center and one and a half year in Furudia. So we were for a long time. Even before that, after the training center, we would, we would be together. We were very good friends since our training center time in 1981. And you get so many talks. I have heard some of the talks by Ishatmananda on YouTube. Very inspiring, very fluent. To talk to you about Swami Vivekananda is like showing a lamp, like a Pradeep, the wick of an oil lamp to, to sun. You all know. But that is also needed. When we worship sun, we say, Jabha Kusama Sankasham Kashyapi and Mahadyutim. Dhuantarim sarvapagnam papagnam pranatos midivakaram. And you say, Esha Deepa Bhagavan Suryayanama. That will be my effort. You know everything, and I will relate whatever I have read from the books and whatever has touched my heart about the advent of Swami Vivekananda. It's not the making, the topic given to me was advent of Swami Vivekananda. It was not making of a yogi, it is the make, advent of a yogi. Yogi was already there. So Sri Ramakrishna, that vision, I'll come to it. Let me go serially.
When we see Swami Vivekananda's picture in meditation posture, we do not fail to understand it to be a serene picture of a yogi who has the stature of Buddha, the grace and strength of Shiva, and the love of Krishna. His body in samadhi, eyes half closed, bereft of any outgoing senses and mind, indrawn and merged in the Supreme Brahman. A question comes to our mind, who is this person? He cannot be a mere human being like us. And really, Swamiji was not a simply just an ordinary human being. Although that great soul was encased in this limited body, Sri Ramakrishna recognized him the moment he saw him. His prophetic words were, where were you all these years? I was waiting for you. You are the Narayana in the form of Nara, God in the form of human being, Nara Rupi Narayana, who has come down to this earth for the sake of lifting the minds of the human race. And he says, I was surprised. Sri Ramakrishna knows everything. But how he describes, you see, he knows that who Swami Vivekananda is. He had the vision that it came as like a yogi will relate that. Still, he says, when he saw, I saw first time to this boy of 18, 19 years, I was surprised to see such a man exist in this Calcutta, city of Calcutta, the capital of British India, very materialistic at the time. This person whose mind, eyes are indrawn, who has no thought of his body, who doesn't care what he has put on, what clothes which, what he wears. So he was so different from other persons that I have seen in the, in the streets of Calcutta. He used to see, when he used to travel in the carriers while going to Calcutta or coming from Calcutta, sometimes taking his head out of the window of the carriers, horse-drawn carriers. And she feels sad. These people here, all thinking of the only about their belly and about, about their ego. The bliss that could, they could generate by thinking of God, they are just missing that. And he used to feel sad for that. And here is Swami Vivekananda, totally different from other persons. He was surprised, delighted, happy. And he recognizes that you are not ordinary human being. You have not been born by your karma. You have been brought for the divine purpose. You are already a yogi. And he related this story to his other disciples. In a vision I saw that I had gone to a place where no mortal can go. There, it was the place of all formlessness. I was surprised to see that there seven rishis in form and maintaining their form or meditating on this divine. How could they be there? He sees with form where even the gods could not go over there. And next time he sees that it was filled with the light, divine light. Then that divine light took the form of a child, beautiful child, and comes to one of the rishis who was in deep meditation and embraces him and, and uh, touching his neck with his little beautiful divine hands and with the touch of the, that divine being, the Rishi opens his eyes out of meditation quietly and this divine boy says, I am going down, you have to come with me. And Swami, Sri Ramakrishna sees in the vision, the way the yogi smiled was the concern, he didn't speak anything, yes I will go was the concern that he is accepting the command of this divine child with joy. And I found, he says, one day I saw a great light coming to Calcutta and I understood some great soul that yogi has come. That yogi has come. This is the advent of the great yogi. How can we recognize the import of Sri Ramakrishna's words spoken to a mere 18 or 19 years old youth from Calcutta? But those words were prophetic to the letters. 
This boy, later known to be the world to the world as a great yogi Swami Vivekananda, he shook the world and created tsunami of spirituality, which swept away all dirt and lethargy and still instilled new life and strength into this world. Let us now try to understand the birth of this great soul, the Nararupi Narayana, who came to this world to remove the troubles of the caused human race and bring solace to the sincere seekers of spirituality. Sri Ramakrishna asked Narendranath, grown up, and said, Sri Ramakrishna was in his last time in his sick bed, asked, what do you want? Narendranath was serving him. He knew the last time has come. He said, I want to remain immersed in yoga and now and then come to the world, to this plane, awake, wake up to this waking state and eat some food and then I dive to the yogic state. Sri Ramakrishna, Guru, who wanted his disciples to go towards God instead of becoming happy, became he uh, retorted and said, what are you saying like a small-minded person? I thought you will be like a huge banyan tree under whose shed will take rest the caused souls of this humanity, of this world, and get solace and peace. And you say, in instead of that, you yourself want the joy of uh, samadhi? No, that's not for you. That was the yogi. That was his real nature that he always wanted to go back to his real state when he was in yoga in that area of Saptarishi. Sri Ramakrishna pulled him down, make him work, suffer for the good of the humanity, good of all of us, so that we get the light, we get the teaching, we get the knowledge, and we get the path for peace and joy in this life, which is so difficult, so burden, if we do not understand him. Swami Vivekananda was the greatest gift of Sri Ramakrishna to us. Yoga means the union of Jiva with Shiva, union of the self with the Supreme Self, the merging of the physical mind in the cosmic mind. The person who by practicing renunciation, combined with discrimination and dispassion, determines the path of, to realization is a yogi. Yogi are two types. Many, the ordinary sense, yogi is made by practice. We practice spirituality through renunciation, dispassion, repeating the name of God, gaining the purity, loving all persons, then meditation and japam, and we become the yogi because you unite with God, the supreme reality, then finally we see God in everyone. Another yogi is, yogi who is already meditating is brought by the divine will. That, that is the advent of the yogi and we are talking about Swami Vivekananda as the advent of a yogi. In Hindu philosophy, the param yogi or supreme yogi that is the concept of supreme yogi. Who is the greatest yogi? It is Shiva. His one form is Vireshwara. Let us see the similarities of this Param yogi with our own Swami Vivekananda. Before discussing the birth of that Param yogi, our Swami Vivekananda, let us discuss briefly the advent of the incarnation of Sri Ramakrishna. It is said in the Gita, by Sri Krishna, yada yada hi dharma se, etc. When there is devaluation of dharma and growth of adharma, I advent to the earth for the protection of goodness and destruction of evil. Let us imagine India, early 19th century, Calcutta, capital city of British India, full of richness, minds of people drawn towards sensual enjoyments, and worldly pleasures, Sanatana Dharma, the teachings of Upanishads were forgotten. Vedic rituals which form a solid base for the Sanatana Dharma was thrown away. Minds of the people 
were every day pierced and torn apart by teachings of various religions, religious teachers who, were, who came from far away and whose teachings were really not connected to spirituality, that the basic spiritual, spirituality that is the core of Indian philosophy. India, the mother of the Sanatana Dharma, was steeped in lethargy and priestcraft, running after worldly pleasures. The time had come, ripe for the advent of that avatar, the greatest of all incarnations, avatar avaristha in the, in the term of Swami Vivekananda, Sri Ramakrishna. But was this enough to attune the minds of the millions of people who were toiling in slavery? Nay, this time the incarnation had to bring with him another great soul, Swami Vivekananda. As Sri Ramakrishna later said about Swami Vivekananda, much before Swami Vivekananda became famous, that Swami Vivekananda was one of the seven rishis or sages. Sri Ramakrishna's vision, a small boy approached one rishi and said, I am going down. You have to come with us. The rishi opened his eyes and consented. This power was Swami Vivekananda. In that zone of highest spirituality, where everything is silent, came an embodied soul who could explain the meaning of that silence to this world, which has lost the capacity to listen. Let us go back to the history of Swami Vivekananda's birth and his family. To bear such a great soul, the mother has to be great soul and the father has to be highly capable. The Datta family of Simulia in North Calcutta was rich and powerful, renowned for many generations for its charity, learning, and strong and independent spirit. Ram Mohan Datta, not to be confused with Ram Mohan Roy of earlier times, Ram Mohan Datta, the great grandfather of Swami Vivekananda, used to manage the office of an English solicitor and amassed a great fortune. They lived together as a huge family. He had two sons, Durga Prasad and Kali Prasad. Durga Prasad was gifted youth, well versed in Persian and Sanskrit. He was very skilled in law and became a partner in his father's profession at a very young age. But he had a very strong affinity for monastic life. After the birth of a son in 1835, he renounced the world at the age of 25 only. He was unheard of for 12 years. He led the austere life of a monk, practicing spiritual discipline away from home. In the meantime, Durga Prasad's wife, Shama Sundari Devi, raised her son, Vishwanath, father of Swami Vivekananda, under great poverty. When Durga Prasad left the house, Kali Prasad, his brother, became the head of the family. He was, unfortunately, not as intelligent as his brother, and neither was that generous. So the huge wealth that Ram Mohan Datta had gathered, collected, had to be spent and was run the very large family, and within a few years, the wealth vanished, and the complete family had to undergo severe poverty. Added to this difficulty, Vishwanath lost his mother and his only hope when he was just 10 years old. He had to suffer the treatment of his uncle, not very kind treatment, at his uncle's hand at this age. But Vishwanath was very brilliant, like his father. And within a short time, he mastered many languages. Persian, Arabic, Urdu, Hindi, Sanskrit, and English. He was a great lover of music. He later studied law and became attorney at the High Court of Calcutta. He gained tremendous reputation and immense wealth and also took care of his uncle and his family. He spent money lavishly on the upbringing of his family and entertaining guests. But he did not leave behind any big patrimony. Both Brahmins and Islamic fakirs used to come to him and receive arms and donations. Vishwanath was married to Bhuvaneshwari Devi, 
when they were very young, Bhuvaneshwari was exceptionally intelligent in managing the house and devoted most of her leisure time in spiritual practices. Calm resignation to the will of God in all circumstances and complete devotion to Lord Shiva, whom she worshipped daily. She knew by heart the passages of Ramayana and Mahabharata, the timeless epics. She passed on the essence of these epics to her children in later stages in their upbringing. Although this couple was very pious and religious, their firstborn son and daughter died during childhood. She was longing deep in her heart for a son who would bring joy to the house and carry on the tradition. She prayed to Lord Shiva for a son. She sent messages to an old aunt of hers who lived in Benares to make necessary offerings to Lord Shiva to the Vireshwara temple and vowed to practice the necessary austerities. Accordingly, she spent day and night in japa and meditation of Lord Shiva. One night, Bhuvaneshwari had a vivid dream. Lord Shiva roused himself from his meditation and took the form of her male child, who was to be her son. She remembered her dream, and a joyous prayer welled up in, inside her. And her, and her long sadhana had finally been graced by her Lord. The light of the world dawned on Monday, January 12, 1863, at 6 a.m. in the morning, in precisely 6 a.m., 6 o'clock, 33 minutes, 33 seconds, a few minutes before sunrise, on a Makara Sankranti day, a very auspicious day according to the Hindu calendar. Every Hindu household celebrates this day by cooking and distributing sweets. Millions of, her, of men and women were celebrating, little knowing that they were greeting the advent of a boy who would usher in a new age of glory for his country, who was to recognize and reorganize the spiritual and national consciousness of India, and who was to become a great apostle, preaching unto the world the message of Vedanta. So this is the introduction of the birth of Swami Vivekananda that you all knew. Just it finds joy to hear again and again how this great soul came and what was the background, how great was his mother and we try to emulate to become like the mother of Swami Vivekananda, guiding our children in our spirituality, trying them, trying so, and wishing and praying that they hold on to our culture which had a long history of thousands of years and has given solace and beauty to the humanity so that they are not deviated and they may absorb the new things in the new world and but let they, let them retain the good things of their ancestors of thousands of years let them retain with that prayer we try to be like the mother of Bile Naren and later on Swami Vivekananda Bile when he grew up was very naughty so you should not be worried about your naughty children and grandchildren Narendranath was very naughty. But he something as he was a yogi in Advent, so to quieten him when he was very naughty and restless, mother found a nice way. And she used to say Shiva, Shiva, and he became like a charm. And he was quiet, just hearing the name of Shiva. Sometimes when he was very restless and didn't hear to mother, mother will reprimand. Bile, if you do like this, Shiva will not take you back to Kailash. And Narendra said, became quiet. What did he understand about Kailash? He, he was a mere child. He didn't hear about anything about Kailash. But this affinity to Shiva was already there because he was, he had the amsa of Shiva. Some people ask me, Swamiji was Shankaracharya, an incarnation of Shiva. According to the Hindu tradition, the incarnations of God are incarnations of Vishnu. We don't have incarnation of Shiva or incarnations of Brahma. But Shankaracharya, of course, he had the qualities of Shiva. So in that way, Shankaracharya has the, 
ha has the many propensities that has the Shiva, Shiva thing. In that way, you could call him as if the Shiva has born in a human being in the form of Shankara, Shankaracharya. Like that is Swami Vivekananda. Shiva himself coming down, that was Murta Maheshwara, Saraswana Chakravarti wrote. The Shiva Maheshwara has become Murta, has become human being in Swami Vivekananda. Murta Maheshwaram Ujjwala Bhaskara and he is the son Ujjwala Bhaskara and he is in the form of human being. So appropriately done. This Shiva, when it is told Shiva Shiva, is still restless, is still this Kailas does not work. Mother used to hold him and pour him water on his head saying Shiva Shiva. You know India is a hot country so pouring water does not make problem. If you are in Chicago in the winter if you pour water you may get sick, you have to pour warm water. But in India, I put Shiva, but Shiva, Shiva is important. Shiva being washed becomes pleased. Shiva is that. You put water and Shiva is pleased. Shiva is pleased with water and willow leaf. So Ashutosha, just put water on his lingam and put willow leaf and say Om Namah Shivaya. Simple mantra, simplest leaf, oil leaf growing and one jug of water, one bowl of water. And Shiva becomes so happy. There is a story that someone, one hunter was in the forest and uh, he went to the forest or in search of some prey, some, some animal. He couldn't find anything whole day. It became evening now, he, could, he had no time to go back to his village. So how to pass in the wild animal fest infested forest, he to save himself, he climbs a tree. And the climbing the tree, it started raining, so not to fall asleep, he to pass the time, he started um, throwing, plucking the leaf and throwing down. And he was just throwing down after some time, he, there is big light in front of him and the light merges and comes the form of Shiva. And Shiva says, I am pleased with you, ask for a boon. She says, I never prayed to you, how you came? So then he, he understood that below that tree was the Shiva Linga and that tree was the bell tree and it was raining, she was getting water and he was getting the willow leaf. He does not think anything else. He is pleased, Ashutosha, even without being prayed. Om Namah Shiva also he did not utter. He was only thinking how to return home back and how to feed my um, family. I could not find any animal today. I could not hunt anyone. Shiva is that. That was Swami Vivekananda. Just he was pleased with anything. Very, very simple, very loving. We talk about the love of Holy Mother. We talk about the grace of Sri Ramakrishna. But we seldom talk about the love of Swami Vivekananda. Swami Vivekananda was the combination of the grace of Sri Ramakrishna and love of Holy Mother. So loving. He did not care for anything. Somebody said here in the West, Swamiji, can I have sannyasa? Oh, you want sannyasa? Come, I will initiate you. Without even tasting, his guru would have tasted hand, tasted mind, seen the physical feature, Swami Vivekananda, nothing. Come, I will give you sannyasa. But later on, Sister Nivedita wanted sannyasa, too much pester, Swamiji, I want sannyasa. She said, no, you ha don't have to get sannyasa. You have some different work as a brahmacharini. You do great work for India. So that's how he guided. But before, he had that, that type of very large hearted person. Hari Bhai, I don't know what your religion is, but my heart has expanded. And that time only he said, this you hear about the parliament of religions being organized in Chicago. Remember that is for this, like his guru he said, he didn't say this for me, that is for this. He was a yogi, born yogi, he knows. And but human factor sometimes comes to this yogi when you take assume the form of human body. When time came to speak, Vivekananda, will you speak now? You turn, he said, wait, wait, after some time. Such a huge audience, never spoken in such a big audience, not prepared anything, what to speak? Great yogi, whatever he speaks, that becomes the mantra, that becomes the scripture. But human factor. So beauty, this, that is the beauty of this great yogi's incarnation coming to the world and behaving like us human beings. Little scared, little worried. Mother Saraswati, please bless me that I could speak something. And then he starts speaking. 
What did he speak? Sisters and brothers of America. What was that special about that? Many persons before Swami Vivekananda had said, ladies and gentlemen, many had said brothers and sisters, many had spoken that. Nobody clapped. There was no response at all. The word had to come from the mouth of a yogi. Whatever he would have said, ladies and gentlemen, whatever he would have said, if that he would have said, it would be the same response. Who is he speaking? What is he giving? How he is touching the hearts of the people? How he is feeling oneness with all? That is important. That is the yogi that came. And Chicago was, it was, it was to the city of Chicago in the whole world to present to the world that this yogi is here who has come in the history. It is very difficult to such people to become human being to come in this, in the, the great yogi to come in this human form. And this city gave and recognized and presented this great yogi Swami Vivekananda to the world. And those who can accept whatever Swami Vivekananda taught, they find joy. Papa Harini, it becomes to them who accept Swami Vivekananda's teaching. Really, all afflictions, all sufferings, all problems have gone if we could follow Swami Vivekananda. Weakness will vanish. We'll feel strong like, like, like God. He has the power to transform human beings into God. That is the power of Swami Vivekananda. When he spoke, he said, I can feel that I can change, transform the mind of others. When he's vanished, his body gone, he has become more powerful, more approachable. Now when we read, as Roma Rola said, I cannot touch the sayings of his without feeling a shock like a, an electric current. Thirty years after he spoke, I'm reading on the pages of the books, the printed letters, how this power comes in this printed black and white things, mere ink, how this power instilled. The thought of Swami Vivekananda works like that. We read, we hear, we see this picture, sit down and meditate, and we absorb the power of this great yogi. Just we need to open ourselves and we become charged. We become charged, we become yogis. That yogi has so much power to transform us to become a yogi. Swami Vivekananda as Bile had fancy for uh, wandering monks and giving the alms to them. Yogi is not attached to the things. One day mother gave her new cloth and someone asked, give me something. He just took out that cloth and gave him. Where is attachment? That is what the yogi is. He is not attached to anything of the world. Shiva, he loves bull, that old bull. He loves um, snakes. He loves whatever animal is there. Swami Vivekananda, from his boyhood, he used to love pet animals. He had monkey, goat, peacock, pigeons, and guinea pig. When he went back to Belurmat, he had Matru, he had that um, uh, Bagha, the, the Matru, the uh, uh, swan, uh, goat, the Bagha, the, um, the dog, and they used to love him so much. That was Swami Vivekananda in new incarnation. He didn't have bull and snake, but he had these animals, and he had tremendous love for these animals as his own self. Among the people's servants, who was his special friend? The coachman, taking control of the horses. Horses, you know, in, in, in Kathopanishad, horses are compared with, with the senses. And this person controls the horses. And Swami Vivekananda likes this person. Mm. Shiva, yogi, you know, he has full control of his senses. And he became the best friend of Swami Vivekananda among the servants. And in this small boyhood, he used to play meditation. One day he and another his friend Hari comes and uh, start meditating and people find these two boys vanished. And searching, searching, they found the door is locked inside and the two boys were in deep meditation. And then mother said, we are searching for you, we are not there. The Hari went away with them, when reprimanded, he said, I want to meditate still further. He had not to practice Siddha Yogi. He was already Siddha. Nitya Siddha says Sri Ramakrishna. And you know the story of that snake when they were playing meditation. This playing meditation, many 
people came, his friends came and they said, let us play meditation. They all sat for playing meditation. All others were really playing meditation. Swami Vivekananda was not playing. He went into deep meditation. That was the problem with Swami Vivekananda. He was teaching meditation later on in the, in the West and while teaching, he himself went to deep meditation. And later on said, no, I should have not have done that. But what to do? You are that. You are always in meditation. You have to be pulled down to the world of us. You are a Nitya Yogi. That is Swami Vivekananda. Snake came, all fled away. All said, snake, snake, who will wake up? You don't have to have this big uh, Vivekananda who have to go to Nirvikalpa Samadhi and in the, in the Thousand Island um, Park here and um, water pouring and uh, there is lightning and he's oblivious of all those things. He doesn't know what has happened. Drains and deep meditation. Swami Vivekananda has not to grow that young and that practice of meditation under Guru. From his boyhood snake comes, everybody shouts, everybody runs away. He's in deep meditation. All others were playing meditation. That's what we do. Let us now meditate, we say in, in, in Toronto, in our puja. Now time for meditation. For how long? Five minutes. What meditation you will have in five minutes? This is all playing meditation. We play meditation. If we do really meditation, it will be long and deep and great joy will come like that. But still that play is also good play. It's of course better play than other play of the world that we, we always play. Swami Vivekananda used to see light between his eyebrows. Wasn't he a born yogi? Did he become yogi through practice? Sri Ramakrishna says, do you see that light? Swami Vivekananda asks, what light? When you sleep, don't you see light at the, in, on, in, in, between your eyebrows? He says, what is special about that? Everybody sees that. So he thought everybody has that. He used to see the light when he um, lied down at night and that light used to become bigger and then used to cover his body inside and that would burst and he would fall asleep. He thought that everybody sleeps like that. He thought everybody is Nitya Yogi. He thought everybody is Nitya Siddha. Where, what was the difference between him and us? That's why he says, I believe in that man whom ignorant calls, I believe in that God whom ignorant calls man. So for him, every man is God. He sees God in every man. And he sees every man as God and wants us that. That is my goal, he says, to preach unto mankind the divinity of humankind. And how to manifest that divinity in every movement in life. That is the sole purpose of my life, he says. Swami Vivekananda was exceptionally intelligent and he master when other uh, people of his age were learning alphabet he learned reading and writing and his way of uh, studying was also very different one tutor came private tutor and he started teaching something swami vivekananda closed his eyes the tutor got annoyed and said i am teaching you something and you are just sleeping closing your eyes swami ji said but i heard everything that you said then te teacher asked and Sri swami vivekananda repeated everything verbatim teacher was surprised and felt embarrassed. That was, that was Swami Vivekananda, the yogi in Advent. Once Narendranath asked his father, what have you given to me? His father was not Sri Ramakrishna. He didn't know what great soul is Swami Vivekananda. Sri Ramakrishna compared Swami Vivekananda with other great uh, spiritual leaders of his time that if another person is like a small flower, you are a thousand petaled lotus. If another person is a small bowl of water, you are a huge jar. If another person is like a small fish, you are a large um, uh, fish, red-eyed um, fish. If another person is um, uh, like a small thing, you are a huge um, that thing. He always compare in that way. A small um, uh, fly worm, you are like a sun. Like that Sri Ramakrishna compared to Narendranath, nothing was manifested. Nothing was known. Narendranath himself was embarrassed. Why you speak this way? People will say you are mad. 
if, even people say you call you Bagla Bamun, then what they will speak talking me about that, I am a simple boy studying in uh, undergrad course in Calcutta University, you are comparing me with those great world renowned person and saying it this way. So, Sri Ramakrishna said, what do I know? If all mother shows to me this thing and I speak that. When Narendranath came and he was spoke here in the Chicago and his fame went all over the world, the news went to India, Swami Adbhutananda was jumping with joy. Reason? Not that Narendranath became famous, one of his brother disciples became famous. The reason was Sri Ramakrishna, his guru had spoken so much about this Narendranath and nothing was known, people did not understand and uh, it has to come true, he was waiting for the day when the world will know what he is. And now is the time Chicago has shown to the world that who real Narendranath, real Swami Vivekananda is, how true are the words of his guru and this has been shown through the city of Swami Vivek, city of Chicago. That made Swami Adbhutananda great jump with joy seeing that whatever his guru spoke came to true. So his father did not know about those that much about Narendranath, but he said, but he knew what Vivekananda was. He said, what have I given to you? Go and see, look at the mirror. That whatever you are in your body and mind, that much is the gift that you have got from me. And that is not a small thing. You are something great. That much faith in your being that he is tall. Mother gave him a very wonderful advice. His own mother, Bhuvaneshwari Devi said, remain pure all your life. Guard your own honor and never transgress the honor of others. Be very tranquil, but when necessary, harden your heart. That was his mother's advice to her, him. And he was, that's why, always gave honor to others. He never transgressed anybody's honor. And when did he become hard? Not when somebody insulted him personally, but whenever someone touched his religion or his country, he couldn't stand that. We know the story in the ship when he was returning. Somebody started saying against him, he was quiet listening in the, you know, on, on, the, on the deck. Those uh, priests who were going to India started saying bad about India. Swami Vivekananda went straight to one of them, held them with collar, one of them with collar, and said, one more word against my country and against my religion, and you will be down deep into the deep sea down. You will be thrown below. And he said with such firmness, and those were really afraid. And we don't know what Swami Vivekananda would have done. He had so much respect to this, his country and his religion. Sanatana Dharma, mother of all religions, all goodness, beauty that human being has, has been shown by this religion. The Catholicity, the love, the beauty, the humanity, the brotherhood, all comes through the uh, religion, Sanatana Dharma. If Sanatana Dharma loses that, respect for other religions, acceptance of other thoughts, accept of acceptance of other cultures, other languages, other people all over the world, treating the humanity as one, treating the religions as one, that Sanatana Dharma has lost its luster, its, its, its essence. Sanatana Dharma is much more greater. It can embrace, it can in include everything. It's all inclusive. That is the glory of Sanatana Dharma, the Vedic Vedanta that Swami Vivekananda wanted to show to the world and say that if we, if we accept this Vedanta, you will transform yourself and you will be able to, what will happen? He used to say, what will happen Swami, what will you give me? I will give you how to love death. That sometimes he used to say, love death? What is that? We are always afraid of, we are afraid of death. That I will give you, I will give you fearlessness. You will be not afraid of anything in the world. You will be free, you will be independent of all things. That is, will be my gift to you. 
that Swami Vivekananda, the born yogi, the Nitya Siddha, the one of the greatest thing that humanity could get from God, teaches us is it that you can do it. You can transform yourself. You can embrace the whole world. And he says in one of the, his, his, his talks, have you ever felt, he says to the audience, have you ever felt warm, widespread, and you feel like embracing the whole universe, feeling one with that? Have you ever felt that this sort of earth, this sort of thought has come, that I'm one with the whole creation? If you have ever felt this, you are close to God. For that he came. Today, we are very happy to remember Swami Vivekananda in this Vedanta, so Vivekananda Vedanta Society of Chicago. May he inspire us to transform ourselves, as he said to Balaram Bushu, when Balaram Bushu complained, sometimes we have this idea, oh, we are in this spirituality for a long time, but where is there is meditation? We have not yet seen God, we have not yet um, um, overcome our ego and little um, uh, weaknesses, but we don't know how far we have already come when we have come to a spiritual path, when we have come to Vedanta, when we have come to Sri Ramakrishna, Holy Mother and Swami Vivekananda or any other form of God, when we have taken this, we are progressing. And to Balaram Basu, he said, you were a cow, now you have become a man and you will soon become God. That is our condition. We were like animals, all the weaknesses full. Now slowly we are becoming human beings, weaknesses going away, trying to feel oneness with all, trying to love and serve others. If we had not that attitude, how can one of you could wait at 1.40 a.m. at night and uh, welcome the people who are coming? You will be sad, oh, why this Swami, they don't uh, consider the time also, come at 1.40 at night, they could come early or they could come next day in the morning, and no complain. And I could see all joy in the, in, in the face of that devotee, of waiting that time. That is the spiritual growth. You are happy with whatever comes. And when that happiness comes in the heart, then the heart says, the prayer that Vedic Rishi said, everywhere it is sweetness and happiness and harmony. What happiness, what joy, what sweetness in the, in the day and night, in the herbs and plants, in the cow and in the dust, in the sunlight, everywhere I find all joy and sweetness, all happiness and bliss. In every human being, whoever I see, I see the face of God. In every eye I look through, I can see the God and divinity inside that. What joy! Anandena imani bhutani jayante, anandena jatani jivanti, anandam prayanti visham vishanti, tad vijigyasasva tad brahmeti. That is the supreme reality, that is the joy, that is God, that ananda, that bliss from which we are born, to which we will go, and in which we are sustained, we are there. Let us absorb that ananda. Let us pray to Swami Vivekananda to make us pure, to make yogi. Sri Krishna said in the Gita, tasmad yogi bhavarjuna. It's because yogi is greater than all others. That's why therefore be a yogi. That is the Swami Ranganathananda says, what a beautiful prayer. Wonderful blessing, be a yogi. Let us pray to Swami Vivekananda. Swamiji, you are Nitya Yogi, Nitya Siddha. You are so powerful. Please make us pure. Please make us yogi. May we be, we be able to meditate on the supreme truth. May we will become pure. And may we be able to love God and love all human beings as our own soul.
very good. Thank you very much, Swami. Very good talk. Very inspiring. So this was the first uh, of our programs uh, to celebrate Swami Vivekananda's 150th birth anniversary. I think next Sunday, Swami Yashavananda, he will be giving the talk. And again, on a, another aspect of Swami Vivekananda. As I mentioned earlier, that um, this is the beginning of our uh, celebration. Every Sunday in September, we have different Swamis and one nun coming and giving talks about Swami Vivekananda. And today, af after the service here, uh, prasad will be served downstairs. So you're welcome to go down to Shivananda Hall. And then in October, we have a fundraiser October 5th with Swami Shantarupananda. And also on October 6th, from 2.30 till 5, we have a program at the University of Chicago in Rockefeller Chapel, a combined program with, between us and the university. And then in November, we have our main celebration called Chicago Calling. It'll go basically from um, November 8th until November 11th. On uh, November 8th, there'll be an international monks conference at held at Ganges. And uh, then in the evening, everybody comes back and uh, they have a program here at Hindu Temple in the evening. Then on the 9th, we have an international devotees conference. We're expecting probably the biggest gathering of uh, Ramakrishna devotees ever. A lot of uh, devotees are coming from foreign countries, from South Africa, and Bangladesh, and other countries. So it'll be a chance to meet uh, uh, people, devotees from all over the world. In addition, we have, uh, as now, over 50 of the monks and nuns, and uh, so it'll be the largest gathering of monks ever held in, uh, outside of India. So these, these will be very important events. It'll be held on the 9th. It'll be held at the Hilton Hotel in downtown Chicago. And um, by the way, the Hilton Hotel was built on the site of the Lion's House. As some of you may know, uh, you know, Mrs. Hale, the uh, famous of Mary Hale, she saw Swami Vivekananda, she took him to the uh, Committee for the Parliament, but his official host from the Parliament was the Lyons family. And so all during the Parliament, he stayed in the Lyons house, which is about five blocks south of the uh, Art Institute, and where the Hilton is, that was built on the exact site where Swami Vivekananda, so that space Swami Vivekananda actually lived in uh, at one time. So uh, that uh, celebration will be at the Hilton Hotel on um, September 10th. Sunday, we'll have Chicago Calling, which will be like an interfaith gathering of the, based on the principles that uh, Swami Vivekananda gave at the Parliament of Religion, which are how this can lead to harmony among the different religions. And then on the 11th, there'll be a tour of places connected uh, with Swami Vivekananda. We think there'll be a program at the Art Institute itself and then a tour of various places. So this would be a unique opportunity to see monks and nuns from all over the world, as well as devotees, many devotees uh, from not only foreign countries, but different parts of America. The biggest function we had prior to this was the Millennium Conference, at which we held up at Ganges. At that time, I think we had maybe 20 Swamis, but we had uh, 750 people came. So from all over, not, you know, I saw this would be a, historic event and you have a chance to be a part of it. We just, I believe, sent out notices by email and also we're just in the process of mailing out the uh, flyers and registration forms and everything. So we ask you all to enjoy this. This is like so this celebration is being celebrated all over India uh, very and all over other places in the world. So it's a very considered very significant event. Om Asatoma Sadgamia, Tamasoma Jotir Gamia, Mritur Mam Amritam Gamia, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. O Lord, lead us from the unreal to the real, lead us from darkness to light, and lead us from death to immortality. Om Peace, Peace.